Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. When you invest in real estate passively, your own involvement is the exception, not the norm. But what if you intentionally become actively involved with real estate, taking on large new construction and rehab projects yourself? It's the rewards and risks of hands-on real estate investing today on Get Rich Education. MC Lobsher is the host of the Cashflow Ninja podcast and president of Producers Wealth. He is on a mission to help you achieve financial independence and freedom as soon as possible. He achieves this by integrating the infinite banking concept with real estate investments to increase your returns and recapture cash flow that you are not even aware of that you're losing. MC shares the number one strategy of investors in his holistic wealth creation course at yourownbankingsystem.com. Finally, Total Control Financial gives you checkbook control of your 401k and IRA money to invest in real estate. It's time to get your retirement money into your own checking account, but you've got to avoid the little known tax that you'll pay with any self-directed IRA. Instead, it's time for the QRP. Learn more and get your free copy of the QRP book by text messaging QRP in all capital letters to 72000. Get Rich Education is brought to you by Ridge Lending Group, Producers Wealth, Lorada Real Estate, and Total Control Financial. You're listening to the show that has created more passive income for people than nearly any show in the world. This is the powerful Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE. You are back in the land where you wouldn't choose to live a day below your means when instead you can choose to expand your means. This is Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. We're changing things up today and not talking passive real estate investing, but rather active real estate investing because that can give you a fresh perspective on passive investing. And we're talking about activities more actively than you just fix and flipping one single house. Now, whether you want to manage a hands-on condo conversion or a value-add flip on an existing 40-unit urban building that has a mix of retail and residential use types, or maybe to you, going big with active real estate investing is positioning yourself as the sponsor or the project manager of a brand new 200-unit apartment building community or senior living community. So it's about new and different ways for you to be profitable. Now, if that sounds daunting to you, we're going to have a wide ranging chat today on where you might even begin or what types of questions you would need to ask of others. And more importantly, we're talking about your internal dialogue going on inside your head and what types of questions you would need to ask yourself And, you know, it's really about whether you've got it inside yourself to take on more ambitious endeavors like this. And I think you're going to have some of those gut check moments today where you ask if you've got it in you. And this is kind of the opposite of all done for you real estate, where you're buying a property that's already renovated and already tenanted and already under management. And, you know, these all done for you projects, they're often suburban and of between one and four units in the size of the property. We're talking about the opposite of that today, when your scale is larger, when you're managing the project yourself, and maybe even in an urban environment. Let's talk more about that framework that you're operating in with a great guest. Today's guest professional life has transitioned from Silicon Valley to real estate. In fact, he's focused the last 10 plus years of his professional life on real estate investment. And this started locally in Canada. He's based in Ottawa, Canada. And today he is the VP of the Ottawa Real Estate Investors Association. But his investing activity quickly moved into the U.S. markets as the opportunities for great investments presented themselves here in the U.S. So it was a real right-hand turn in his career after spending the first 25 years in the high-tech industry And, you know, he's got what I call big picture vision. He is not a small thinker. He has conducted business in over 15 countries. He's been awarded patents. He's forged numerous partnerships. 
He's raised capital, acquired businesses, negotiated deals, and he's led numerous organizations. He is the host of The Real Estate Espresso and author of the book, Magnetic Capital, because he is an expert on raising capital from others. Welcome back to Get Rich Education, Victor Menage. Great to be here. Victor, you know, I think a lot of investors, when they get started out, one mantra is to start small, but think big. But after someone has started small and often acquired a few properties in the one to four unit space, they often think, what's next? Should I acquire more properties in the one to four unit space? Or is there a better way for me to scale up? What are your thoughts? One of the things that happens, you do the math, you say, okay, I just completed this fourplex building. And of course, whether you're doing a four-unit building or a 40-unit building, at least from my perspective, the effort is almost the same. You know, unless you're out there in the field swinging a hammer, the effort, you know, to put together a project, the effort to manage a project is virtually identical, almost irrespective of the size. Now, there's a little bit more complexity with larger projects, but by and large, putting them together is almost the same effort. So all of the things being equal, I would rather do bigger projects. That's just me. Now, if you're just getting started, you might be thinking, well, that seems like an awful lot of risk. I don't have the money, the team. Uh, how am I going to put together a 40-unit project if I'm only doing four-unit projects today? And one of the challenges with these smaller projects is that you're in the world of what's called residential underwriting, yeah. which means that when the bank looks at you, they're assuming that the path to repayment of that loan is your employment income. And that's not necessarily a good assumption, but that's how they underwrite it. That's how they look at it. So at a certain point, you know, you amass a certain number of doors and they say, okay, you're cut off now because your income can't support any more than 10 units, 14 units, whatever the number is, you know, being so-called fannied or freddied out, the lenders will, will basically cut you off. But if you think about it in the world of commercial, imagine if you owned a thousand unit complex your individual W-2 income is not going to fix things if there's a problem on that project. Not even a tenth of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the, the asset, it's the performance of the asset that counts. It's the performance of the asset that is the path to repayment of that loan. So they, your individual income doesn't even factor into the equation at all. So if you want to break through that ceiling that you will eventually hit, if you haven't hit it already, you need to flip over into the world of commercial. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, how can I do that? I, you know, I don't have enough balance sheet. And the key here is to think about it as a team sport. A lot of people go into the world of real estate investing, treating it the same as they would when they were in grade school. You know, if you're working with somebody else on your math test, that's called cheating. But in real estate, it's not. That's called teamwork. And that's really where you want to get to and not try and do everything yourself. If you do everything yourself, you're going to be stuck in that world of doing very, very small projects. So we're talking about when you're thinking about scaling up and buying a five plus unit residential building, Victor is referring to the commercial loans that you need to go ahead and secure for a residential building with five or more units in them. And yeah, there is a reason that when you get into five plus units, a line is drawn. When you're trying to qualify for a one to four unit property, sort of like Victor said, they're looking at your income because your income can have a lot to do with being able to make the payments on that property. But when buildings get larger, that's why underwriters begin to look at the performance of the asset and not your individual income because the assets performance is the make or break factor. And as you get into these larger projects, whatever your income is, they're still going to look at that a little bit. They want to be sure you're not a threat to the property, but that's not going to factor into the no-go decision like the performance and the cap rate and the DCR of the property is. Here, I'd like to throw out a little trick here that maybe some of your listeners may not have even thought of. Imagine for a moment that you have three fourplex buildings and they don't even have to be right next to each other. They could be a couple of blocks apart. Let's say you've borrowed, you know, acquired those projects individually. What you may want to do is consider refinancing as an entire package and put a blanket mortgage across all 12 units as if it was a 12-unit building. Now, they don't have to physically be on the same property. A lender may look at that and may be willing to put a commercial line over the entire project. And that could be a very effective way of transitioning with your existing portfolio out of the world of residential underwriting into the world of commercial, literally with the flip of a switch. And now you've freed up a whole bunch of borrowing headroom and you've got yourself into the world of commercial underwriting. 
Talk more about how that works from a perspective of recourse versus non-recourse and how when one tilts from a residential loan into a commercial loan, now one might be more likely to be susceptible to interest rate risk. Well, so there's really a number of different things that lenders look at. I mean, the first question they ask, and it's the only question they ask really, is if I lend you money, how am I getting it back? Now, they ask it 50 different ways, (laughs) but that's really the only question. So the question is, how am I going to get the money back if things go well? How am I going to get the money back if things don't go well? So they secure their interest in the property with a lien. That's called a mortgage. And that is their security. And if you know they will loan at some loan-to-value ratio that they feel safe with, and if, if they end up going above that, they will find an insurer, maybe Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or, or FHA, someone to insure that loan so that the bank is not taking on any undue risk above a certain ratio. And then from there, they say, well, if I burn through all of that in a repossession, in a foreclosure or a power of sale, depending on your jurisdiction, then I'm going to come after you, the borrower, for the balance. And that's typically what's called the recourse. That's often called a personal guarantee, where they will come after you for your car, your house, your boat, your second child, and so on. Obviously, that's where people try to limit their exposure. You know, you put assets in entities so that if the entity itself goes down, hopefully it doesn't cascade into every other corner of your life. But recourse, meaning a personal guarantee, can. And increasingly, there's a very large percentage of commercial loans, especially on stabilized product, that can be written as non-recourse loans. And in fact, when you move into the world of commercial, if you have that income history, typically three years, you can often get a non-recourse loan. Now, it's harder to get, the bank's going to require a whole ton more documentation, but you may be able to get a non-recourse loan and, you know, protect yourself and your family's assets by just having that one difference in the terms of the loan. Now, oftentimes the way one can go bigger and reposition themselves is not to make a new purchase with their own money so much, but rather doing a tax deferred exchange, say out of some fourplexes or some smaller properties into a mid-sized property, say a 10-plex to a 12-plex, and really just transferring their equity. So just talk to us about the mindset of what you see investors go through when they make that transition into something that's sort of getting into that middle area size-wise of a 10-plex to a 12-plex. I love those smaller buildings, you know, sort of 9, 10, 12, 15 unit size buildings. And we do we actually do quite a lot of those. They're not necessarily home runs. They're for us, we consider that like a base single, maybe a bunt even, uh, because they're fairly repeatable. Now, when when I say that, we're focused very much on creating value, solving a problem in the marketplace. What that means is if there is an excess of demand, a shortage of supply, you go into the neighborhoods where you can find property at a decent price and, and build new construction. That's been our focus for a number of years we created a tremendous amount of value. Now, the strategy that we've used to do that is something we call buy on the line, move the line. It's a very, very simple strategy. And every city in America has this line. That line is, you know, maybe on one side of the line, you have a hot gentrified neighborhood. There's a Starbucks on the corner. There's maybe an art gallery. And you go two blocks on the other side and you're in the hood. And I know if wherever you're listening, you can visualize that line in your city. I know yeah. because it exists every city in America. So what you do is you buy just on the wrong side of that line. Typically, you can buy that land for pennies on the dollar and you redevelop. Now, if you just do one, nobody cares, nobody notices. But if you put a little bit of scale behind it, maybe you do five, maybe you do 10, the marketplace says, oh, the line has moved. I get it. Now, you might say, oh, I don't have the resources to do five buildings at once. Okay, that's fine. Get some friends together. Put together a consortium of maybe four or five other investors like you that want to do the same thing. And it's not competitive. It may feel competitive, but really it's not when you put a little bit of scale behind it. Now, you may not get a hundred cents on the dollar for your rents for those new buildings. Maybe you'll only get 95 cents on the dollar. People are willing to save that extra 50 bucks a month to live a block or two away. That might be a great value for your prospective tenants. They're moving into new product very close to a hot neighborhood. Yeah, it's a little bit on the wrong side of the line, but they're willing to walk a block to be in the hot neighborhood. It could be a very effective strategy. Buying one single family income property on the wrong side of the line is not enough critical mass to help move the line, but with a 10plex or 12plex, it often is. 
It often is. And it can set the tone for an entire block, particular if that happens to be on the corner. The corners often dictate the tone and the character for a particular block. So if you're thinking strategically, focus on acquiring the corners because that gives you control of the block. That's a great point. Now, just in my personal investing history, if I see that there's a property that I can buy that's on a corner or there's a like property that's not on a corner, I typically go for the one that's not on a corner because I'm often thinking that, well, that's more quiet. So it's more likely to cater to families and people that are going to want to stay there longer. But you're actually bringing up some benefits of buying on the corner. It gives you a little bit more control. It means that you can acquire some of those properties that are mid-block and now bring those up. You can often pay less for those, the ones that are mid-block, and you can create a tremendous amount of value, but only if you control the corners. The corners are the gateway. It's kind of the, it's your curb appeal for the entire block. Yeah, it's a very interesting way to think about it. Yeah, I guess when I think about buying on a corner, I'm thinking about buying turnkey properties in the suburbs that you know, maybe aren't tone setting as much as what we're talking about here when you go with a larger building in a more urban area. So the mindset around operating a 10plex or a 12plex, that might be intimidating to someone that's thinking about scaling up. You're probably not yet at the scale where you would use on-site management. Now you have some substantial common areas that you might need to manage. So just talk to us about the operations of a 10plex or 12plex size property that you're just not thinking about if you've been a single family income property investor. There's many ways to look at it. You know, for example, we built a lot of nine unit buildings that were constructed as three triplexes side by side would have virtually no common area. You know, don't take it as a given you're going to have a ton of common area. You're right, you would not have on-site management. And, you know, what we've often done is we've built a lot of these smaller buildings in close proximity to each other within a five or 10 block radius. So, you know, as time goes on, not right away, but as time goes on, you start to acquire reasonable size portfolio, 70, 80, 100 units, within a five to 10 block radius. And now you can start to effectively manage that as if it was a virtual single monolithic building, even though it's distributed over a few blocks. But you've got enough concentration of assets that you can manage it as if it was a single multifamily. How far are you going with the amenities in the operations? How large does a building need to be for you to add an elevator or to add parking? That's a very good question. Typically, what I've found is that An elevator is really more about height. Typically, in most cities, if you're going four stories or above, you need an elevator. If you're three-story, you can get away without an elevator. You know, an elevator is expensive, $60,000, $80,000, $100,000, depending on what you put in. Uh, That's almost the cost of an apartment, and elevators bring you no revenue. So that's just pure cost. If you're only amortizing the cost of an elevator over 10 units, well, that's a lot in terms of incremental cost per unit. And then often, you know, you get into a larger building, you don't need just one elevator, you may need two, you may need a service elevator. Now it's starting to get expensive. So if your first step is going from, you know, the one to four, and you want to go into smaller buildings, try and stay under that 35, 38 foot height, where you're three story, or if at worst, you go three and a half story with basement units, but you still stay within that height restriction, and you're, you're staying without using an elevator you'll save an awful lot of money. Now, when we talk about taking on a larger project, 10 years ago, it was substantially easy for an investor to buy a property for often just half of its replacement cost. It was become increasingly difficult to do that. So to me, it seems like that would tilt more into doing a greater proportion of new construction rather than renovating existing. Tell us about that. Absolutely. In fact, you know, when we started, it's exactly like you said, construction cost was much, much higher than what you could buy things on the open market. So it didn't make sense to build. You could buy things for below replacement cost. Today, it's reversed. When you look at what leased up stabilized product is selling for in the open market, it's often a third more or even higher than what it would cost you to build brand new. So if you can start with a piece of dirt and build a brand new product for 25%, 30% less than things are selling for in the open market, it starts to look interesting to me. And it's a bit more work. You got to be patient. You may have to wait 18, 24 months to get that revenue stream, but still the savings often are worth it. Now you've got to be sure that the market's going to be there when you're finished. You don't want to be highly speculative. You got to really know your numbers. But if you do, if you've got uh, good consultants that are supporting you, giving you good market data, 
You've got appraisals that you've had a look see of, you know, buildings in the neighborhood. So you feel very confident that your post construction appraised value is going to hit your target. Then absolutely you should consider new construction because there is a pent up demand for nice new places to live. You asked about parking. Some cities have a shortage of parking. And one of the things that we have focused on in the last several years, and you know, a lot of our constructions in Philadelphia, which is an older city, very narrow streets, not a lot of parking, mostly street parking, and parking is a huge, huge issue all over the city. So we have incorporated ground-level structured parking. We have not gone underground, but ground-level structured parking in several buildings and elevated the building up onto second, third, and fourth floor, and still managed to get away without putting in elevators. So we've been able to incorporate parking, create value that differentiates the product from the rest of what's available in the marketplace, so that if there was an economic downturn, the chances of a building with parking having vacancy are still so close to zero that it's you're not even going to talk about it. The vacancy will go to the buildings without parking. That's a great point. Now, I know what you might be thinking right now. Victor's talking about consultants in a team, and this just all sounds really daunting scaling up, especially perhaps if you're building new construction. So we're going to tackle that next. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Our guest is Victor Minaj. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Would you like to know the easiest way to create wealth and passive income with real estate? This is Marco Santarelli with Norada Real Estate Investments. Now you can access the best deals without the stress or hassle of having to find, renovate, or manage those properties. We save you time by providing you with passive income investment properties in some of the best U.S. markets. Learn more by downloading your free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Passive Real Estate Investing. There's no obligation and nothing to buy. Simply visit PassiveRealEstateGuide.com and get your free copy today. That's PassiveRealEstateGuide.com. For a real estate investor like you seeking an income property loan, go to Ridge Lending Group, NMLS 42056. Over the years, you've heard President Chaley Ridge generously devote her time to you here on the show as a guest. Ridge provides investment property loans in most U.S. states, and you're going to find out how they've helped more people realize their dreams of real estate financial freedom than any other mortgage lender in the entire nation when you get started at RidgeLendingGroup.com. This is author Kristen Tate. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold and don't quit your daydream. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. We're talking with Victor Minaj about scaling up What's your mindset and the actions that you take into getting into more and larger properties? And, you know, Victor, I think what a lot of people are thinking is, I already have a full-time job. I'm more into being a passive investor. I've got a family to spend time with. I hardly even have any time to use my 24-hour fitness membership at the gym there as it is. So, you know, if I'm not yet at the point of feeding my own family passively from real estate, then how could I bring more people onto my team or how could I possibly pay them? Well, so you touched on two separate ideas there that I want to split apart and tackle each one separately. The first is passive investing versus active investing. There's no such thing as a passive business. They're all active businesses. Sure. Now, you can invest passively in an active business, but the idea that you invest passively and you are passive in an active business, even though you're actually responsible for it, that doesn't work. So you you have to make a decision. Am I going to be active or am I going to be passive? Now, you might say, I haven't figured out how to afford the lifestyle of being active in the business because I still have my regular nine to five job. Right. How do I make that transition? And this is the problem with staying small. The projects are too small. They don't pay you enough to replace your employment income. And so you get stuck in this low earth orbit that you can never escape. And so you say, all right, well, I'm going to try doing some bigger projects, but how does that help? I just need more money and I don't have enough money. Well, the thing is, when you start a project, if you take on a really large project, I'm going to say, let's imagine you're going to build a 200 unit project for a moment. And on that 200 unit project, this might be, I don't know, a 30, $35 million project. Do you think on a 30 to $35 million project, there might be a spare 100000 to pay your salary for that year while that project's under construction? The answer is yes. You can easily embed that in the project. Right. It's typically called a developer fee. In fact, the developer fee would be quite a bit larger. It would feed four or five families. 
on a large project. So now let's scale it back to something that feels a little bit more comfortable. Could you do two or three 10 unit buildings in the span of a year and take a project management fee or a developer fee on each one of those? And could that developer fee replace your W-2 income, your nine to five job? I think the answer is yes in a lot of cases, but you've got to be willing to make that leap and build that into the budget so that the budget of the project will in fact feed your family for the period of that construction. Now, you need to continue to do that for a period of time, two, three, maybe four years, where part of your income is coming from fees and proportionally over time, more and more of your income is coming from the income generated by the income producing assets, those buildings that are spitting off cash flow at the end of each month. So it's a gradual transition, but you're going to be starting by feeding your family initially out of those construction projects or could be renovation projects as well. You could be repositioning a building and taking a developer fee or a repositioning fee or an acquisition fee. And the way to think about this is you might be saying, well, I've got my hand in the cookie jar and that's not the right way to think about it. Imagine if you were responsible for that project and you got sick and you've taken investors' money, who would you hire to step into your place to fulfill that role? Because you have to protect your investors' money. It would be irresponsible not to. So you have to, out of a sense of responsibility, out of your fiduciary duty, you've got to embed that cost, that expense, into the project's budget. And then you can say, well, can I fulfill that role? If yes, then I'll take that budget line item for myself and I'll hire myself to fulfill that role. Or I could hire a third party. It's really your choice. But the investors will understand that that's, in fact, why that line item is there. It's there to protect them. Okay, so now you figured out how to feed your family out of project management fees, out of developer fees. You, as a single individual, are not big enough a team to take on these larger projects. You don't have the breadth of skills, nobody does, to manage a project end-to-end from start to finish. Even if you did, there aren't enough hours in the day. You'd be limited to running very, very small projects or having a very small portfolio just because of that limitation. So again, take that thinking, extend it a little bit further, and put together a team of two or three people. Now you've got some bench depth. Now you have the ability to go take a week vacation or get, God forbid, get sick for a week or what have you. You've got some bench depth. You've got some resilience in your team. And investors like that because they don't like to invest in the self-employed. They like to invest in businesses, which by definition have some sustainability. They have a little bit of scale. It's going to be easier to raise the capital for larger projects than smaller projects because they feel that their money's safer, and it is. Any last things that are holding back investors from scaling up that you often find in your experience? Some people just don't even really know where they should begin. What I hear the most common constraint is, I don't have enough capital. I I need access to more money. And once you learn how to raise capital and you knock that one down, what you'll very quickly discover is that there's another constraint hiding right behind it Usually, in my experience, it's project management. Not always, but usually it is. And what I'm talking about there is having the skills to know how to manage your construction team, to hold them accountable, to make sure that the scope of work was done correctly, make sure that you haven't missed any major line items. When there are cost overruns on projects, most of the time, it's not because drywall costs 10% more. It's usually because There was an entire scope of work that should have been in the budget for the project that was missed altogether. And that comes down to having a disciplined approach to project management. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to go out and hire, you know, a a PMP certified project manager, 120,000 a year, but you need to somehow get enough of those skills in your team, maybe from another team member, perhaps on a part-time basis, so that you get that part right. That's a critical item. How do you find these team members? Relationship building. It's a very organic process. You're looking for people that you get along with in terms of chemistry, but you don't want to hire people or you don't want to partner with people that are just like you in every respect because then one of you is redundant. Right. You want people that complement your skills. If you're great at marketing and you're terrible at project management, get someone who's the opposite of you. If you're great at fiscal management and terrible about something else, find someone who's the opposite of you so that you have that complementary, well-rounded skill set. And typically, I find you need usually a minimum of three people in a team to build a sustainable business. 
That's a great point about seeking someone unlike you because you tend to congregate with people that are much like you. And a lot of times you're going to find someone that has a complementary skill set. Think of it that way. Think of them not being opposite you, but that has a complementary skill set. Right. Maybe that's your own real estate investor meetup. Exactly. And those people are out there. They exist. And, and they're stuck too because they're missing what you have. So it can really be the marriage made in heaven if you have the right chemistry. The easiest person to get along with is someone who thinks like you, talks like you, acts like you. But like I said, then one of you is redundant because you're not really adding any value. Yeah, they're the least valuable when you're scaling up. Was there any last thing with scaling up, Victor, that you'd like to add that I didn't think about asking you? If you don't have the skills or the track record in your team, then go find someone who does and bring them into your team. Oftentimes, one of the things that investors look for is your track record. And, you, you know, they really want to see that experience base before they'll invest with you. And it might be very tempting to say, well, how can I raise money if I don't have the track record? How can I get a track record if I can't raise any money? It's an infinite loop. And the way to break that is to find a way to partner with people that have the track record that you might be lacking. And I'll give you a simple example. Uh, you know, I'm doing a project right now. It's a much larger project than I've done before. I feel very competent. I feel very comfortable running that project myself. But I also recognize that the investors may not see that in me from a distance. So I brought someone into my team who has experience building 10,000 units of construction in his career. So that whole discussion gets taken off the table because when they look at him, they see, okay, this guy can do this with his eyes closed. We feel comfortable. And that just takes that all completely off the table. Yes, I've got to share the project with that individual, and that's perfectly fine. Don't try and negotiate 100% in ownership of something because you may end up negotiating 100% of nothing. I'd rather have 5% or 10% of something significant than 100% of nothing. Being a hermit and staying within yourself might work to a certain point, but not very likely on these larger projects. Victor, how can our audience learn more about you? I publish the Real Estate Espresso podcast seven days a week, five days during the weekday. It's a short form podcast, five minutes, just myself on what's new in the world of real estate investing. And on the weekend, we interview notable people from the world of real estate investing, interview style, a little longer, 10 to 15 minute segments. And we'd love to have you listen, love to have you engage. And uh, if you want to reach out to me directly, you feel free to visit my website at victorjm.com. That's victorjm.com. Or you can email me directly at victor at victorjm.com. Victor, you're an expert at raising capital and going larger. Thanks so much for coming back onto the show. Great to talk with you again, Keith. Well, from time to time, it's great to get the perspective of someone that operates differently, but still within the real estate space. It brings a fresh angle to what you're doing. Now, the documentation that you have to come up with for financing is still fairly difficult in residential mortgages for your properties of four units and less. Underwriters look at everything and they seemingly look everywhere. Not much better, but better is commercial portfolio lending. It still requires personal recourse a lot of times. And while more emphasis is placed on the asset, the bank still looks at you quite personally. With the big stuff, the options for financing are pretty wide and they know you can't and you won't repay a giant property's debt if things go badly. So that's why underwriters focus on the asset. And you know what? They also focus on who will be managing your asset. In one to four unit residential, underwriters aren't asking you all about your manager. The thing is, with the big stuff, lenders won't even think about loaning to you if you think you can manage a giant asset yourself. It is a professional job that a professional should do. Lenders know that, and they'll want to know that a professional third-party property manager is the one managing the project. And as such, the commercial lender could be underwriting the property manager even more than they underwrite you. In fact, within this world of going big and being hands-on, if what you've bought is too small to afford or attract professional management, this is a problem in a lot of ways, and that even includes the debt. By default, this can push you into an even larger asset since this type of a professional property manager 
is just not going to manage that smaller or mid-sized stuff. It was the late comedian Bob Hope that said, a bank is a place that will lend you money if you can prove that you don't need it. That is still pretty true today. What's really important in construction, new construction, is getting the scope of work right. It's that you don't miss something fundamental. In new construction, you can often have fewer surprises than if you're taking on your own rehab. In fact, in new construction, you often have a detailed checklist. For example, in new construction, you won't run into some old asbestos like you could if you're taking on rehab projects yourself or some electrical code thing. Now, in passive investing, a turnkey operator is the one that takes on that sort of rehab risk for you. If you're in new construction and you're being active, your surprises might be more foundational, like literally down in the ground. Your underground excavator might hit a five foot thick layer of organic peat that the test borings didn't show existed, and you're going to have to undercut and do a cost overrun. Or you hit bedrock when you didn't expect it, and you're going to have to hammer or blast away that rock. In fact, if you're an active investor, you and your team can be good at what you do, and that can still happen. And yes, I actually used to deal with those situations when I had a day job as a construction inspector, geotechnical engineering and geomorphology, building foundations made of caissons and driven piles and spread footers. Yeah, that's my former day job world. I haven't talked about that stuff very much on the show yet, probably because we talk more about identifying passive real estate investment here. In any case, you've definitely got to get your market and your submarket right as well with hands-on real estate investing. That's not too different than passive real estate investing there. And in a lot of markets, apartments have been overbuilt. And some places, almost incredibly, I'm told, even have assisted living facilities that are overbuilt. But of course, there are still local areas of opportunity. You've just got to build that team if you're going big and you're getting hands-on. So thanks to Victor for that perspective today. When it comes to passive versus active real estate investing, it really comes down to what your interests are and I think how much time you want to devote to all this. What is investing to you and what is a job to you? And if active involvement happens to be a job that you think you could love, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just you. It comes down to thinking about your return on time invested again or maybe thinking about the letters ROI, not as return on investment, but instead your return on involvement. Next week, we're going to discuss passive real estate investing rather than active real estate investing. And we're going to host two guests next week that make up a team that have created more passive income for you than anyone else in Get Rich Education history. I'm Keith Weinhold, and I've been grateful for your listenership today. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. As America's third largest city, Chicago, Illinois, has big economies of scale for real estate investors. But there are problems with investing in highly taxed, fiscally strapped Illinois. You can beat it when you invest in Chicago land, staying on the Indiana side of the state line. Your property tax on a median Indiana home is less than half that of an Illinois property. Forbes ranks Indiana as one of the top 10 states to do business. With typical rents at $1,250 and purchase prices at $125K, Northwest Indiana numbers work. Learn more and connect with the turnkey provider at GetRichEducation.com slash Chicago. That's GetRichEducation.com slash Chicago. 71% of Americans aren't saving enough for retirement. It's going to get worse as people live longer, and you need to start thinking differently. But you can't lose your time. Real estate is the investment vehicle that's made more ordinary people wealthy than anything else. Keith Weinhold of Get Rich Education is host of one of America's top investing shows, Disrupting Wall Street. He's an international best-selling author, a writer for Rich Dad Advisors, and has been an active income property investor since 2002. 
He has created thousands in passive monthly income for countless followers. And now he has a free book, The Seven Principles for Creating Wealth in Your Life. Get your copy now at getricheducation.com forward slash book. That's getricheducation.com forward slash book. Because invest in what produces income for you now and later. Sign up now at getricheducation.com forward slash book. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.